Um, I am going to talk tonight about Vernon and Irene Castle, who were superstars in an era before television, before radio, although radio would not have been particularly pertinent. They were ballroom dancers. Uh, ballroom was not a new form, but they really brought it to a height and made it respectable. And that was one of the things they did. They were extremely glamorous, extremely sought after. They performed in New York, they performed in London, and they performed cross country. And I'll talk more specifically about it as we go along. But my good friend David Bathelar the other night said to me, what do we care about them now? It's 98 years since Vernon died. And, um, you know, other than sort of a footnote to history. And then I thought, well, I better show you the cover. This is Dancing Times, which is a, the oldest dance magazine in the Western Hemisphere. And this is the March 2016 cover. Good. And so if you wonder about whether the spirit of the castles is still alive, I can assure you it is. And I don't know how many of you have watched one of those goofy programs, So You Think You Can Dance, or you know, whatever else they're called. I would watch them more if we could shut the judges up. Because <laughs> I love the dancing, so they let the people dance for about a 30 seconds and then the judges carry on. And so after the first time watching it, I said, that's it, I'm done with that. So, um, and if you know anything about um, the state that, as in all interesting practices in our society, like dog shows or horse shows or uh, cooking, sh cooking competitions, there is a huge underground world of ballroom dancers in America. Harvard has a very active ballroom dance group, and they compete all over the country. You don't see them on television, but there are these competitions all over the country, and in England particularly. Um, years ago, my husband and I were, went to the Ritz for tea dancing, and there was these gorgeous people, all dressed to the nines, dancing on the ballroom floor, so much so that we, we followed one of the couples <coughs> out, of the ball, out of the Ritz ballroom, because they were so beautiful, and the woman was just dressed, you know, with the floating scarves and everything. And they came in from the country, especially to dance at this tea dance. So I, I think these people are really the direct descendants of the castles. Um, before we begin, I thought we'd start with a picture show. Margaret is our trusty technical director. Um, this is a statue of Irene Castle, who was drop-dead gorgeous. Um, and that statue is actually at the New York Public Library. This is Irene, uh, photographed by Baron de Meyer. What we, this is a slideshow, I just wanted to give you this quickly. This is Irene and Vernon in the only film they made, uh, the 1914 World of Life. This is Irene in one of her costumes. This is her in the costume in a show called Miss 1917. She became a silent film star and this is uh, Irene in, in Patria, which you'll hear more about this later. Again, Irene. This is Vernon and Irene, an absolutely beautiful photograph of the two of them. Irene again. She was very popular. She cut her hair in the castle bob. And this is the two of them in the skating step. Again, um, this is Vernon. They loved animals. Vernon on his horse. It's Vernon when he went into the Royal Flying Corps in his uniform. Another one of Vernon in his uniform. And this is Vernon with his brother-in-law, Lawrence Grossmith, who was a famous actor. And this is Vernon with Ford Dabney, who was the head of a black orchestra. And Vernon and Irene Castle were the first white performers to use African-American uh, musicians at a time when this simply wasn't done. They, were, they didn't appear on the same <laughs> stage. They didn't appear in the same nightclubs at all. And he knew enough to uh, have Ford Dabney and James Reese Europe uh, as his musicians. Many of these pictures surfaced um, in a, a box of lost correspondence that, that came to light only about five or six years ago, and I will talk a little bit about that more also. Uh, this month marks the 100th anniversary of the World War II start of the Battle of the Somme, one of the bloodiest periods of World War I. The battle ran from July to November, and the number of casualties on both sides were shocking. The Allies lost 
more than 623,000 oh killed and wounded. Did you get that? Six, over a half million. The Germans, 465,000. The Battle of the Somme is also remembered as the first modern war in which air power played an important role for surveillance and bombing on both sides. Although the British Royal Flying Corps, uh, which was the title before the RAF, is counted as the winner, it was a Pyrrhic victory. Of the 428 pilots who went up in that battle, 308 of them were killed. Just think of that. Three quarters of the pilots. And think of those rickety planes, and think about 1916 was only, what was it, a dozen years after the Wright brothers? I mean, yeah. it's just extraordinary. Well, the reason I mention that is one pilot who did survive the Battle of the Somme was the ballroom dancer and Broadway performer, Vernon Castle. You saw pictures of him in his uniform. He, Vernon, together with his wife, Irene, were at the height of their fame as theater superstars of the era before World War I. Born Vernon Blythe in Norwich, England in 1887, he had come to America 10 years earlier with his sister Coralie Blythe and her husband, the actor Lawrence Grossmith, and he began a career on the American stage. He changed his name to Vernon Castle so he wouldn't be confused with, with Coralie Blythe, and he became what we would call a second banana in the vaudeville uh, acts. He, he performed with Lou Fields, who was a beloved vaudevillian who became a Broadway producer. And Vernon was the one who got hit on the head with the baseball bat. He was the one who slipped on the banana and fell. Um, it wasn't a very uh, sophisticated career, but he, was a, he became a, what we call a moderate big star. Uh, he was tall and very thin. In one show when he appeared in a green suit, a critic said he looked like a bunch of asparagus. <laughs> in 1910, about five years after uh, Vernon came to America, he met the 17-year-old stage-struck American debutante, Irene Foote. The couple were married a year later. Uh, her father was a very distinguished doctor and was a little nervous about her marrying a showbiz person, but the marriage went through. She was 18 years old, and they began their career as a ballroom dance, as ballroom dancers by a fluke discovery in Paris in a Paris nightclub, but I'm going to talk about that a little later. By 1915, after the two of them had become superstars um, and had starred in New York in Irving Berlin's first Broadway hit, Watch Your Step, and then after the show closed in New York, went on tour with the show, Vernon became increasingly agitated and determined to join his country in fighting World War I. You will, of course, remember this was before the Americans came into the battle. Vernon signed up for flying lessons in 1917 in Newport News, Virginia. He paid for it himself, and he was licensed as a pilot. Um, and as soon as he got his license, he went to England to join the Royal Flying Corps. He left Irene behind on tour and watch her step and sailed to England in February 1916. He received his commission to join the Imperial Royal Flying Corps in March, and by June he was at the front in France with his squadron, the 84th Royal Canadian Flying Corps. He was a faithful correspondent to his wife, despite the censorship and uneven mail service from the front. And one of the great treasures of this period, and actually of dance history, is a little box which Irene kept all of his letters in, and Castle has that box of the letters, the original letters, in the family archive. And I was lucky enough to be able to work with them. Vernon flew as an aerial photographer. Just think about that for a minute, in those planes flying low over the German, German lines and their guns shooting. He accompanied bombers on their missions during the Battle of the Somme, and finally carried and dropped bombs from his own plane. While on active duty, he completed 150 sorties, miraculously escaping serious injury when several of his planes were hit. He was awarded the Quadriguerre in February 1917, 
and in April 1917, he was finally taken off the battle lines and sent to Canada to train pilots. In November of 1917, the uh, training school was moved to Texas near Fort Worth uh, to escape the bitter Canadian winter. Vernon Castle's luck ran out on a training mission with a student pilot on February 15, 1918. Um, he was sitting in front, Vernon was sitting in front, the student was sitting in back. The plane crashed because another plane took off right in front of them and Vernon banked to try to avoid the other, or the student banked to try to avoid the other plane. The plane crashed and Vernon sitting in the front seat was killed. The student walked away. Um, a year after his death, Irene published a book of his letters called My Husband, um, somewhat edited to keep out the um, personal material. I just want to show you. This is the original. You can pass this around. Um, the couple had also published a book several years earlier called Modern Dancing, which you can also pass around. Um, which were pictures of them and showed them dancing because they also ran a very successful dancing school in between their showbiz um, assignments. Uh, the book is a poignant remembrance of a performer who matured through his wartime experiences into a beloved leader of men and a hero. At the height of their fame, before Vernon enlisted in the Royal Flying Corps, Vernon and Irene were an irresistible pair. He invented dances to music that introduced the syncopated ragtime rhythms adapted by the Tin Pan Alley composers from the African American community. Everyone could join in the fun, either watching them or on the dance floor. With the castles as models and teachers in between their performing stints, it became fashionable to abandon the private ballrooms for nightclubs and to dance in public among people from different backgrounds. This was a big switch, especially for what you might call the upper class Americans who went to debutante balls or private parties. Um, if you remember back in the days when people could afford it, many of the homes had private ballrooms. If you go to Newport, for example, you can see that. Um, so it was a big switch to make it um, okay to dance in public with people you didn't know. As Irene later explained, we were young, clean, married, and well-mannered, which made their style of couple dancing acceptable to polite society. They also looked like they were having so much fun on the dance floor that everyone wanted to join in. The castles broke with theatrical custom to hire African-American orchestras for their supper club appearances at a time when theater performances were segregated the blacks appearing in their own shows, the whites on stage, or in nightclubs are restricted to other white people. You probably know that by the 1920s, the clubs in Harlem were very popular with white society, and so people would go up to Harlem and attend the shows, but it was never the other way around. But the castles counted their black musicians as their friends. The African-American conductors James Reese Europe and Ford T. Dabney compose music for their dances as well. Um, can we show, what I'd like to show now are some film clips of Irene and Vernon actually themselves dancing. I might tell you that in the 1920s, my father, this is after they, the castles period, but when ballroom dance was still very popular, my father won a loving cup in a contest in Chicago with another woman. And when I was a little girl, I found this loving cup. It was tucked in the back of their closet under the clothes. And I used to take it out and I once asked my mother about it and I never heard too much about it. But <laughs> it has since been lost as so much family history. I'm sure you all have similar things and I'm so disappointed. But um, anyway, that, that's part of the family history. So Vernon went off to war in 1916. Uh, the couple were still starring on tour in Watch Your Step. Um, and after Vernon sailed for London, Irene stayed with Watch Your Step on the U.S. tour, but did not appear in the London production. By 1916, she had signed on as star of the 15-episode series, The Propaganda Silent Films, produced and funded by William Randolph Hearst. The series was called Patria. She appeared in costume. 
or in uniform. And the intention for Hearst was he really wanted America to join the war. So he funded this. And I, uh, she was voted the most popular film star of 1916. But Castle and I have talked about this, and we wondered if that was something that Hearst rigged up, because she wasn't, at that time, well known as a uh, film star. Um, her last appearance on Broadway was at a spectacle called Miss 1917 with a cast of other well-known stars. Um, she danced alone. Although the show was well received, it only lasted six weeks. Um, and it was uh, a big flop. Um, she had been cut earlier from the cast to save expenses and was furious about it and sued the producer um, later on. And there's varying reports about whether she won or not. Can we show the second? Um, they, they danced together several times during the war at benefits. Um, and Vernon must have seen Miss 1917 because there's a letter, an unpublished letter, filled with uh, advice from him to Irene about how she's dancing and how the show looks. Um, the final correspondence from Vernon to Irene is a series of cables at Christmas time, 1917, about his coming to New York for the holiday. It was surely the last time that they saw each other. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to give you a treat. I'm going to. Can we show the um, the, 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 the yeah. Okay. Yeah. The um, in 1939, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers made the last of their wonderful series of musicals, and it was called The Story of Vernon and Irene Castle. It is an absolute glorious movie. You can sometimes find it on the television uh, on television. Um, and what I'm going to, we're going to look at is the scene that recreates their discovery in Paris uh, at the Café de Paris. It didn't happen exactly like this, but sort of like this. It's a Hollywood version. And interestingly enough, the servant that came with them to Paris was a family servant named Walter. And um, he was a black man, but Hollywood was afraid to show a black and two white actors living together in Paris. I want to stop here in talking about Vernon and Irene Castle to describe my own attachment to the family and to Irene's children and grandchildren. Um, I've been lucky enough to be a dance historian and a dance critic and a theater critic for many, many years. And I've also had enormously rewarding encounters with either the subjects of my research or their families. And so it has been with the family of Irene Castle. Irene went on to marry three more times after Vernon died. Her third husband was Major Frederick McLaughlin, a Chicago socialite who owned the family business, Manor House Coffee, and the Chicago Blackhawks hockey team. Um, with Fred McLaughlin, um, Irene had two children, Barbara and Bill, William. Um, in the 1980s, when I was assigned to write an encyclopedia article about Irene Castle for Notable American Women, a biographical dictionary developed by Radcliffe College and published by Harvard University Press, I didn't know much about the castles. Mm -hmm. But by a fluke, a close friend of mine was helping research the books by Ralph Martin about Jenny Jerome, the Chicago heiress who married Randolph Churchill, uh, she was one of the American girls looking for a title, or the family was looking for a title, and they were the parents of Winston <coughs> Churchill. Uh, it turned out that Jenny Jerome had dated Fred McLaughlin before her marriage. So my friend put me in touch with Barbara McLaughlin, Irene's daughter, who ultimately became a close friend. Uh, we first met by phone and by correspondence, but a year later she became a postdoctoral fellow at, at Radcliffe and lived in Cambridge, which is where we live. Uh, Bill McLaughlin, uh, Irene's son, invited me to stay with him and his family in Texas, to, and his wife in Texas, to look through the enormous family archive. Um, I was lucky enough to spend several days there. Uh, Bill's daughter and namesake for her grandmother is Irene Castle McLaughlin. <coughs> Castle is now a uh, PhD anthropologist and senior curator at the Peabody Museum in Harvard University. Uh, her specialty is the 19th century Plains Indians and the Lewis and Clark Expedition. And she's also my good friend. Um, and I, after I finish, I'm hoping Castle will talk a little bit about her grandmother. Uh, she has a wealth of information. 
So, to continue the story of Vernon and Irene Castle, when Vernon was killed in the plane crash in Canada, Irene was in New York. She received the first cable shortly after he died from the commander at the base, followed by cables from his closest friend and his valet. These letters and the hundreds that followed um, after his funeral at the little church around the corner, uh, that's the show folks church in New York City in Greenwich Village, um, had been kept in a large wooden box along with Vernon's photo album from his wartime years. This box was totally unknown to the family until a few years before Bill's death in 2011. Um, a man just showed up, called Bill McLaughlin, and said, my family has kept some property of your family for decades, and now I want to return it to you. This wooden box held more than 300 letters, 103 cables, and numerous cards, plus the photo album. Uh, we think the man's grandfather must have been an employee at Manor House Coffee and found the box in Major McLaughlin's safe after his death and after the business closed down. So these letters, which surfaced and which Castle and I are the first people to look at 98 years after Vernon died, um, are a revelation in terms of the many people who respected and loved Vernon uh, from folks in show business, including Irving Berlin, David Belasco, and many others. Long, sad letters from Vernon's father in Norwich and his sisters, and letters from people who were fans and didn't know the family at all, but felt compelled to write. Most poignant were the letters from women who had lost husbands or sons and were sending their sympathy and their advice on how to deal with such a terrible loss. Also in the box was the grimy, t torn bit of paper which held the prayer that Irene had written before Vernon left for the service. Um, it's in this box. I have a photocopy of it. It's too fragile to bring. But it was a prayer she had written to God to keep him safe. And every time he went up in the plane, he wore it around his neck on, on a ribbon. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's very moving to see it. Vernon also left a letter for his sister, with his sister Gladys in case he was killed during his service. Uh, this letter was printed in the bio autobiography that Irene uh, published in 1958 called Castles in the Air. Um, and I'm going to pass this around as well. Uh, when you get this letter, I shall be gone out of your sweet life, Vernon wrote. My only thought, darling, is for you. The letter was longer than this. Irene wrote after receiving the letter, I buried my face in my hands and wept. Irene's grief at Vernon's passing was profound, but their marriage had been in trouble. As early as 1916, rumors were published about an impending divorce, which both denied. Both of them had other involvements while separated, but even with these distractions, the bonds between them ran deep and strong. She continued to support him handsomely with her earnings while he was in service. They shared a love of animals. They both kept pet monkeys, and Irene cared for his beloved German shepherd dog, Tell, while Vernon was away. Irene was very beautiful, young, and a famous celebrity, an icon for her clothes and her style. It was no wonder that she attracted admirers. Perhaps Vernon's perennial attraction to women can be explained by his place in a family of four adoring sisters and a beloved stepmother. And who is to say what might have happened if Vernon had lived? One wonders if their style of dancing, so discreet, beautiful, and mannerly, would have survived in the raucous rough and tumble of the dance fads of the 1920s. One could hardly imagine Vernon and Irene dancing the Charleston. Irene retired from appearing in silent films after her third marriage to Major McLaughlin, but her career would probably not have lasted into the era of the talkies. Uh, she had an untrained voice, uh, which elicited comments when she sang or spoke on stage. Uh, and given Vernon's expertise in the air, it is likely he would have joined the new airline industry that burgeoned after World War I. Indeed, such a project was mentioned in an unpublished letter dated November 19, 1916, about the plans he was making with a comrade. Quote, 
We hope to start a flying concern on a very large scale in America after the war. And whether or not the marriage would have continued is anyone's guess. After Vernon's death in 1918, Irene wrote a poem, later published in Vanity Fair, that read in part, And so the lights are dimmed, the dance is o'er, the music hushed, the laughter dies. Irene Castle lived until 1969. 51 years after Vernon was killed, she was buried next to him in Woodlawn Cemetery in New York. Thank you. Um, um, I'd like to ask Castle if you, Castle, can you stand up or talk a little bit about your grandmother? And she went every summer, virtually of her life, um, from the time she and Vernon uh, left for Paris shortly after their marriage. And so I was fortunate enough to go along on some of those excursions when I was a child. Um, we took, um, we flew a few times in the plane's early uh, propeller jets, but I remember that she had a first class berth that actually had a bed. Um, as a child, you know, that was kind of a novelty, so I remember that. Um, we took some of the big ships, um, the Queen Mary, I think, was one, and she dined at the captain's table every night. Mm -hmm. She was still quite famous when I was young, um, and she's still in the New York Times crossword puzzle a lot, but <laughs> mainly f because she's credited with inventing the bob haircut. Um, she never left the house uh, without looking perfect. Um, she wasn't a super maternal grandmother, but she was incredibly interesting. What she cared about the most, I think, um, was animal welfare and also civil rights, and she was much more interested in that than her legacy as a stylist and, and beauty. Um, she opened an animal shelter in Chicago, and she despite being kind of a, a grand dame, um, you know, would get in and, and do the dirty work of cleaning the kennels and going and picking up stray animals and, and putting them to sleep even if that had to happen and that sort of thing. Acting and theater and film were very different then, um, and Ginger refused to wear period clothing. Irene was very, she was on the best dress list for decades, and she was very um, concerned about style, and Ginger did not want to wear her hair the way that Irene became, you know, famous for, or color her hair, or do anything to recreate the period, so that was her objection. We bonded because we're both passionate about horses, and I was never really into that kind of thing. But I think she had already given most of the historic um, garments to museums by that point. And I don't remember her ever referencing those. Museum of the City of New York, I believe, had some others, although those might have been ruined in the um, hurricane when the um, Hurricane Sandy came through. They, those might have been ruined. They had a, a wonderful uh, exhibit some years ago in New York at the Met at the Costume Institute called Seven Ladies, Seven Women of Fashion. And one was Isadora Duncan, and one was Irene Castle, and then there were five others. And it was a beautiful exhibit they had. Did, Nancy, did you see that by any chance? No. Oh, it was a beautiful exhibit. And yeah, each one was in their own area, and they had the music of the era uh, playing. And, and you saw some of, some of the beautiful costumes um, as well. When I... Um, visited Castle's father and his wife in Texas. I worked with the original letters that were published in my husband, but she had cut some personal material out of that. And um, we, you know, Castle has the letters, although she thinks her father might have burned some of the letters before he died. Um, but Bill let me take the letters home. I had them Xeroxed and then sent them back. Luckily, I'm honest. And he was wonderful about trusting me about it. But it was very, it was just so exciting to be part, you know, part of the family. We remained very, my husband and I remained very friendly with Barbara and her husband until Barbara 
passing some, a few years ago, and um, I was friendly also with t two of the daughters and with Castle, so it's become a really important part of my life. In this issue, I, I wrote an article which this, um, about them. It was, this was published in March 2016. Um, I was in New York. The scrapbooks, Irene had a series of scrapbooks with all the clippings about her and Vernon, about five or six of them, which were given, um, she arranged to have them given to the New York Public Library. So they're there, and I was, you know, there doing some work on them. I had already looked at them years ago. And I had seen the statue, it's by Prince Trubesky, who was a, a Russian who came out of Russia, then lived in Paris, lived in New York for a few years, lived in Paris. And he did two beautiful statues, this one of Irene. Actually, there were more than that, there were four, because there were several that the family had. And uh, one of the two of them dancing. And they're just sitting, if you go into the New York Public Library, the research library at Lincoln Center, and you go into the theater section, they have some um, card catalogs, the old-fashioned card catalogs. Two of them are just sitting there on top. It's the yeah. Performing Arts Library. Yeah, 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 Lincoln Center. And so I, um, they very kindly photographed them for me, but the catch-22 is they don't know who gave them to the <laughs> library. They don't know whether Irene Castle did or someone in the family. And without knowing who gave these statues to the library, they cannot give me permission to show them in an article. I can show the photographs, but I can't print them because the subject matter of the photographs is unknown. And one has to wonder why the New York Public Library does not know who gave something as valuable as these two statues to them. There's so many uh, performers of that era that we have nothing. We have nothing of Nijinsky. We have nothing of Isadora Duncan. We have a snippet of Anna Pavlova. By the way, next week, Jane Pritchard will be speaking about Anna Pavlova. Uh, she's coming from England, and she has some film. So if you're interested, it's sort of the same era. It was Pavlova and the castles were around uh, at the same time. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure. <laughs> Thank you.